Thank you so much, Ethan, for that lovely special number. Take your Bible, please, tonight. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. There are the lessons for this evening. 1 John chapter 2. And as we're turning there, let me review just briefly a couple points as we continue our series, which will go about two more weeks in regard uh, to this matter of Calvinism. I like to say with each installment as to why I'm speaking on this topic. The reason I'm addressing this topic is because Calvinism in its more dangerous forms is now becoming popularly acceptable within the ranks of fundamentalism. Now, each week I've attempted in the introductory remarks to give an example of this and how it is affecting those who are Bible-believing Christians. Now, let me say that the effects of these things begin in the theological seminaries and then they trickle down into the churches. So if there is a trend, as an example, that would take place in a theological seminary and be damaging there, it will cause more damage when the trickle-down effect finally reaches the churches. And the full extent of that trickle-down effect may not be felt in the churches for one generation or more, but indeed it will be felt. And this has been uh, the tendency all across the board. By the way... Uh, I like things to stay the same. Now, I'm not against change if it's an improvement, but a lot of change is not an improvement. A lot of change is dangerous. I read this week, and I just had to chuckle. Oh, I had to chuckle. I read this week where someone, in fact, he's not probably two years older than myself, maybe three years older than myself, where this individual is publishing his own edition of the Greek New Testament, and he is the editor He's not probably maybe two or three years older than myself. Can I, can I serve notice on you folks? People that are my age don't have enough sense to be editors of the Greek Testament, okay? Bottom line, that's, I, I'm speaking for myself. I don't have enough sense to do that. And, and number two, I wouldn't dare tamper with the Word of God. You ever read in the book of Revelation that says you're in trouble? At the end of the book of Revelation, if you take anything out of this book, you're in deep, deep water with God. I wouldn't tamper with the Bible. I would never be so arrogant to do so. You say, preacher, what would cause a man to, to, to want to edit his own Greek New Testament? Well, I, we've got so many of them available, and I mean many of them. What would cause someone to be that arrogant? Just pride. It's just sinful pride. That's all it is. There's absolutely no need for another edition because it doesn't change. The Bible doesn't change. Now, having said that, uh, why, why the discussion, the ongoing discussion of Calvinism? Because in recent years, this emphasis has entered some of the churches. Now, here's my burden. A lot of men will say, well, so-and-so believes it, and so-and-so believes it, and so-and-so believes it, so I must believe it too, without ever really looking at the foundation of some of the doctrine. In addition, many, many men do not understand that the tenets of Calvinism, as taught currently by contemporary Calvinists, are not only uh, misinterpretations of the Scripture, but many times, as we're going to see tonight, they are doctrines that are outright denials of the Bible. None of the points of Calvinism as they are defined by contemporary Calvinists, and we will bring those definitions to bear in a moment, none of those points are actually found taught in the Scripture, and most of them are a logical extension of having accepted one or more of the others. So tonight we're on the third point of Calvinism, limited atonement. Did Christ die for the whole world? This evening we're going to address the issue as essentially as this. The efficacy of the atoning work of Christ, to what extent is Christ's work efficacious? Did Jesus Christ die for the sins of the whole world? Right away my audience is saying, well, you know, Pastor, of course He did. And I'm saying that with you. Do you know why I'm saying that with you? Because the Bible says that He did. Now, I don't want to shock or amaze this evening, but as I studied into this, I found that there is a whole branch of professing Christendom that not only doesn't believe that Christ died for the whole world, but believes very strongly that Christ died only for a few, and that the blood of Jesus Christ is only effective for a few. Now, let me make this practical, because I like to put it down to brass tacks. These folks, by the way, tend to be ivory tower scholars, most of these Calvinists do. I like to put it down to brass tacks. Whereas you won't see R.C. Sproul coming down to Good News Ministries mission down here on Washington and Rural Street the first Saturday of the month. He just won't show up there. I, I do go down there. And when I preach at the Good News Mission, there are maybe 60 or 70 men sometimes, depending on the weather, crowded into that little gospel chapel. And I preach to those men, and some of them, doubtless on any given night, some of them 
will be first-timers at the Gospel mission. For some, it will be the first time that they have ever heard of the Gospel. And as I'm preaching at Good News Ministries, this preacher will stand before that bedraggled congregation and will look out upon them and will say to them these words, Jesus Christ died for your sins. Do I believe that? Yes, I do. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be there. If I didn't believe that every person in that audience, regardless of who they are, that every person in that audience can make a decision to put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and be saved, and that when Jesus died on Calvary's cross, He died for every individual in that audience, and that not one person in that audience is in any way excluded from the potential of the efficacy of Christ if He will meet the condition of faith. When I stand before that audience, I preach Christ died for all. But you say, Pastor Monty, this is very um, basic. It is unless you accept the doctrines we're talking about tonight. And this particular one, the concept of limited atonement. Now, before I go off too far, your Bible's open to 1 John chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. The ideal is that Christian folk not sin. And if any man sin, God presents an ideal not to sin, but then quickly He says, if any man sin, because that is our, our lot in life. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now verse number 2. And He, referring to Jesus Christ, He is the propitiation for our sins. Now pause with me. The word propitiation means satisfaction. It means that the only way the wrath of God is assuaged is by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God Almighty is satisfied only in His wrath with the sacrifice of Christ made on Calvary's cross. There is nothing else that will satisfy God. Philip Gulley in his recent book said that God does not demand a blood sacrifice. Philip Gulley is a liar. And by the way, a misrepresenter of the Bible. Horrible, horrible book. God has always demanded a blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for our sins. God is only satisfied by a blood sacrifice. But the author of the book of Hebrews, or the writer of the book of Hebrews, tells us that it was not by the blood of bulls and goats. Those could not take away sin. They merely covered sin. They could not take it away. But by the sacrifice of Christ is God Almighty satisfied. So, verse number 2 again. He, Christ, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only. Now, who is he writing to? He's writing to Christian people. Christian folk, He is the propitiation for our sins, Christ is. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's just right there. It's right there. You, you, well, you say, preacher, they must really do some stuff. You wait till you... Hmm. It's obvious, isn't it? Obvious. We well, say, Pastor, how does a, a person who claims to be a Bible believer but is also a Calvinist, how do they deal with that verse of Scripture? I was amazed as I studied the changing of definitions. The, the way certain words now cannot mean what they say but have to mean a whole different thing. And I'll, I'll get into this in just a moment. He says, Preacher, why does, this, why does this, this picky little doctrine stuff fire you up so much? It's not picky, for one. I just, just said that. It is entering the church by storm. I'll give you a name. John Piper. These things were not done in the closet. He is an author. He is a pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church of Minneapolis and has recently, and by recently I mean within the last ten years, become a very popular conservative evangelical author. He is also a very strong Calvinist. Mr. Piper has become, if I could use the terminology, the Pied Piper of New Evangelicalism. And unfortunately, his swan song is leading a lot of fundamental people that direction. It was amazing to me what Piper did to this verse. He completely denied its truth and said that the idea of the whole world means only the world of people who are predestined to be saved. Now, let me give you a review so you understand. We said in session, well, the, the, when we started the doctrinal points, remember total depravity? We define total depravity as inability. 
Inability, that's what, how they define it. Inability means this, that no one can receive Christ as Savior. You can't do it. You cannot make a decision to choose Christ because of your sinfulness and because you are unable to choose Christ. You can never choose to do right, according to the strong Calvinist, because you are unable to do so. In order to become able, how does someone get saved if you're unable to be saved? In order to become able to be saved, you have to be born again. Now that happens before you're saved. Now folks, I'm not making this up. This is what Calvinism teaches. Okay, they all teach this. You have to be born again before you're saved. That can sometimes happen as an infant in the heart of a child. A person to whom this experience takes place doesn't even know it has taken place. So they have they, this inability then is taken away because they are given the ability by God to believe. There is a belief of complete inability. The second point we talked about last week, unconditional election. Because of complete inability, you have no choice in the matter. Therefore, God has chosen whom He will to cause to be born again in order that later they might be saved. Now, you say, preacher, do people really believe this? Please, folks, listen. It amazes me. The complication here amazes me. So someone is completely unable. Let's pick on Rick over here. Rick is unable to be saved. There's nothing he can do. I can, he's not, let's pretend Rick is not one of the chosen. Okay, Rick is not one of the elect. He's, he, he missed the boat somewhere in eternity past. Rick can sit here, according to that doctrine, he can sit here and listen to me preach the gospel time and time again, and he couldn't be saved if he wanted to be. Truth is, he wouldn't want to be. But he's unable. He couldn't be. There is no possible way he can listen but cannot be saved. Now, let's say though, for sake of example, Rick is no longer one of... Well, let's use Brother Falls. You know, if anyone is elect... Right there. He's got to be. If anyone's going to make it, Brother, <laughs> he's going to on his own merit. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Brother Paul's is one of the elect. He gets born again before he gets saved. So when I preach the gospel, he responds to that. Guess what? He could do nothing but respond to it. He is unconditionally elected. He had no choice. We'll get into irresistible grace after a while, but he had no choice. So he makes the what, he doesn't make the decision. He is saved because he's been elected. Do you see how this, this thinking is hard for us? Because we're thinking in one way and they're thinking another. He can't be saved over there. No matter what happens, he can't. This guy over here, he will be saved. He has been born again before he got saved and eventually will receive Christ as his personal Savior. There is nothing he can do. He is going to receive Christ. He's not going to receive Christ. Now, that has been determined, according to the Calvinist, from eternity past, Okay? You are damned. You're going to heaven. And so the Calvinist says, based upon that, since this was determined in eternity past, there is no reason for Christ to have died for the sins of the whole world. The Calvinist says He didn't die for everyone's sins. He did not die for Rick's sins because Rick wasn't chosen. And Rick is unable to choose Christ he wasn't chosen. He's never been born again in order that he might be saved sometime in the future. Therefore, Christ didn't die for him. Christ only died for the elect and for the church. That is essentially their teaching. Ladies and gentlemen, may I say it kindly, that is heresy of the first rank. Now, we're going to see why in just a moment. Look at your introduction paragraph. As previously seen, Calvinism limits the love of God by proposing that God has only chosen to save a few and damn the rest. Unconditional election. Study the last week. Accepting this point logically leads to the idea that Christ did not die for the sins of the whole world, but rather for the sins of only the elect. Calvinists teach that their doctrine of limited atonement, quote, limits the atonement to the elect. That's a direct quote from one of them. Calvin stated, quote, all are not created on equal terms, but some are preordained to eternal life and others to eternal damnation. Now please understand, those are strong words. They are Calvin's words. And based upon that, they have concocted the idea of a limited atonement. Let's look at this. The importance of limited atonement to Calvin's system. A. Many who claim to be Calvinists declare themselves as four-point Calvinists. Four-point Calvinists leaving out the idea of limited atonement as unnecessary. Now this, I'm being very honest here. 
there are many people who will say that they are a four-point Calvinist. In fact, it was almost a watchword at college and in seminary classes. It's almost a watchword if someone says, well, where do you stand in regard to this matter? People almost automatically say, well, I'm a four-point Calvinist. They don't even know what that means when they're saying it. Most of them don't. But they just say, well, I'm a four-point Calvinist because they reject the concept of a limited atonement. It's so obvious it's not in the Scripture. However, the five-point Calvinists, who are the true Calvinists, they are the true blue line of John Calvin Calvinists, they accept the concept of five points of Calvinism and the concept of limited atonement, and they say that it is absolutely essential to Calvin's system. Now, it would appear that they are correct. The idea of limited atonement, however, is so obnoxious to anyone who has even a cursory understanding of the Bible that some of them do reject it. My point is this. If you meet somebody who says that they're a Calvinist, most likely they don't have a clue what they're claiming to be. Most likely they don't understand it. And so we continue. Leading Calvinists, point B, leading Calvinist authorities, however, believe such four-point Calvinists are guilty of abandoning the entire system. Let's cite some of these. A. A. Hodge, quote, If they, the critics of Calvinism, could prove that the love which prompted God to give His Son to die as a sin offering had for its objects all men, in other words, if they could prove God loved everybody, that Christ actually sacrificed His life with the purpose of saving all on the condition of faith, then the central principle of Arminianism is true. Put the word true there. That's A.A. A. Hodge. And then by default, Calvinism is false. As, as I added that in there. But by default, Calvinism is false. A.A. A. Hodge said if you could prove that God loved everybody and that Christ died for the sins of everybody, then Calvinism's in trouble and Arminianism is true. A lot of us have heard the term Arminianism and we've kind of got a, a, a funny idea about it because of some folks that we know that claim to be Arminian, Arminians. They say, well, we believe, you know, some Arminians believe they can lose their salvation. We certainly do not believe that. Uh, Arminius himself, by the way, did not believe that. His followers later added that as a tendon to their belief system. Arminius himself did not believe that. However, I would not call myself an Arminian. I would call myself a Biblicist, okay? Simply believing what the Bible has to say. Uh, but the central idea is this. Is it true that God loves everybody? Is that true? Yes, that's true. Absolutely. Again, I defer to preaching down at Good News Ministries. You see, a lot of people have this theology up here, and they'll sit in a classroom somewhere with a fine point of their pencil sharpened, ready to dot all their theological I's and cross all their theological T's, and they'll never think of how it affects people. Ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is this. When I'm standing in front of a congregation at Good News Ministries, I can point to those fellows and say, I don't know all about you. I don't know the sins that you've committed. I don't know what has brought you to this point in your life. But fellows, there's one thing I can say about each and every one of you. There are no exclusions. God loves each and every one. And I can say that in all honesty and I can say it on the authority of the Bible. And if I could not say that, I would not bother to go down to the mission. I would not bother to preach to that crowd if I could not honestly tell them that God loves every one of them. The Bible says it's so. I can honestly tell them that Christ died for every one of them. The Bible says it's so. We'll get there in just a moment. And so Hodge says that if you deny the concept of limited atonement, you have undermined all of Calvin's system. Point two, these guys, Steele and Thomas, they wrote some books about Calvinism. They are Calvinists. Quote, Christ's redeeming work was intended to save the elect only. The elect only. And actually secured salvation for them. His death was a substitutionary endurance of the penalty of sin in the place of certain specified sinners. The gift of faith is infallibly applied by the Spirit to all for whom Christ died, thereby guaranteeing their salvation. If I believe that, then I could not preach the gospel whosoever will. And by the way, let me ask you a question. Was Jesus giving us a sham of a command when He said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Why preach the gospel to every creature when not every creature can respond? 
What would be the point of that? Why is the command to preach the Gospel universal, covering every creature? And over and over again, as we're going to see in a moment, the teaching of the Bible is whosoever will may come, that Christ died for all, that His sacrifice on Calvary may be efficacious for all by the condition of faith. We're going to see that from the Bible in just a moment, over and over again. What would be the point in our evangelical, evangelistic, and soul-winning attempts if first we, had to, first we had to tell somebody, you know, the truth of the matter is, I don't know if Christ died for you. Now, if I'm a Calvinist, I have to say that, to be honest. I have to go to Rick over here, who's still part of the non-elect. Rick, I hope we can get you elected by the end of the evening. <laughs> I have to go to Rick over here. Rick is a lost person. You work at White Castle, right, Rick? That's a wonderful place to work. Surely only the elect work there. <laughs> I love White Castles. I go to the White Castle, I, 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 get a big, I get a big sack of 20. And that would just be for myself, to be honest with you right now. Just love them. Can't have them on the Atkins side, but I love them. I get a big sack of 20 and I have a tract in my pocket and I'm about to take out the tract and hand it to Rick. If I'm a Calvinist, I cannot tell him that God loves him and be honest about it. Now, I'm just being, I'm being upfront with you right now. I cannot say... Rick, here's a gospel track that tells you how you can be certain you're going to be on your way to heaven. Did you know the Lord Jesus Christ died for you? I cannot say that if I'm a Calvinist because I'm lying. I don't know that the Lord Jesus died for him if I'm a Calvinist. I know he died for the elect. And only if he's one of the elect, according to Calvin's system, did he die for Rick. I don't know that. And so really, I have to be, if I'm going to be an honest Calvinist, this is why, by the way, they don't preach in gospel missions. <laughs> if I'm going to be an honest Calvinist, I have to go over and I have to say, hey, you know, Rick, here's, here's the gospel tract. And if you're one of the chosen, the light bulb's going to go on the minute you see this tract. And you're going to be drawn irresistibly. In fact, if you're one of the chosen, you're in like Flynn right now. Nothing I can do or you can do will affect it any way, shape, or form. Have a nice day. You say, preacher, are you oversimplifying? No, I'm giving you an example so you can see practically where this doctrine leads, okay? I tire of doctrine like this being pumped in the classroom into the eager young minds of college and seminary students who never translate it into real life, who don't look into the eyes of someone who is just desperate because they've lived a life away from God whose life is broken, who bears the mark of sin. They never feel a twinge of compassion for that individual. They never see that person as lost and dying and on his way to hell. By the way, may I make this statement? If human beings have the capacity for compassion over every lost sinner, do you think God is any less? God loves people. Christ died for the sins of the whole world. This is a very serious matter. Continuing on, point C. Well, how did the Calvinists deal with John 3.16? You know the verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 declares several things. Number one, God so loved the world. The whole world, no limitation. What are you going to do with the word world there, preacher? Well, if you're a Calvinist, you have to change that to mean the world of the elect. But it does not say that. It says the world, okay, the, the cosmos, all creation. God loved the world. Number two, He gave His only begotten Son to be born and ultimately to die for sins. John 3.16 clearly states that the atonement would be made for the sake of the whole world, okay? The whole world. And that God loved the whole world. And that God gave His Son for the whole world. R.C. Sproul, leading contemporary Calvinist, writes concerning John 3.16, the world for whom Christ died cannot mean the entire human family. Put the word entire there. Oh, it can't? It can't? Why not, pal? By the way, it does in numerous other places that do not touch the issue of soteriology. And Dr. Sproul would admit that that word has a universality about it in every instance where it does not affect soteriology or the doctrine of salvation. The world for whom Christ died cannot mean the entire human family. It must refer to the universality of the elect, people from every tribe and nation. Blah, blah, blah. That's not in the Bible. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. In fact, people who do buy it, they've been sold a bill of goods. 
That's not in the Bible. Do you think that Nicodemus had any concept of this elect from all corners of the earth? No. Did Nicodemus have any concept of the church? Of course not. That concept had not even been introduced. When Jesus said to him, to talk to him about believing and God loving the whole world, do you think Nicodemus viewed that as only a select few of the chosen? Absolutely not. Now, folks, let me say this. When the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. The Bible just plainly says Christ, God loved the world, gave His Son to die for it. Point three on the next page, on the back page. John Owen states, quote, that the world here cannot signify all, put the word all, that the world here cannot signify all that ever were or should be is as manifest as if it were written with the beams of the sun. That the word world, speaking of John 3.16, here cannot signify all that ever were or should be is as manifest as if it were written with the beams of the sun. But he never explained himself. How is that manifest? Let me ask you a question. When you read John 3.16, let, let, let's, Awana, let's get real, folks. Let's just get real. Awana is going on upstairs. Praise God. And we've got Awana workers. And I thank God they're not theologians. They are Awana workers. Thank God for that. And uh, they're upstairs and they have their Bibles. And they take John 3.16 and they explain to a third grade girl. They say, Susie... John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And little Susie says, Wow, God loved the world. I'm part of the world. That means God loves me. May I say that little Susie has more sense than a lot of theologians. Why? Because she took the Bible for what it says. And she didn't try to change it to say something else. Pastor, why would people try to twist these clear verses? Uh, one reason, the defense of a theological system. And there are some people that feel they cannot function theologically unless this system be held in its ironclad uniformity. And that is certainly not the case. It's silly. It's, it's death to hold to it. Palmer, point four, Palmer, another, we've cited him numerous times, Calvinist, because God has loved certain ones and not all. Can you imagine this guy? I wouldn't let him work in Awana. He is a theologian, and I would bar him from working in Awana. Beth, Beth couldn't have this one, Jay. Okay? She couldn't have this one. Let's listen to what he says. Because God has loved certain ones and not all. Because He has sovereignly and immutably determined that these particular ones will be saved. He sent His Son to die for them, to save them, and not... All the world. Put the word not there. Oh, can you imagine? Now, folks, get real again. Get real. To what purpose would Mr. Palmer's pronouncement be when he stands behind the little pulpit in the chapel at Good News Ministries? What, what possible good news would that be? Isn't the Gospel good news? If the Gospel is good news, then the good news is Christ died for all. That there's not one man in that congregation that cannot be saved because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, can cleanse from all sin. And that He died for the sins of the whole world. That's good news. Isn't it good news when you're included? That's good news. That's Gospel news. It is bad news when you're not included. It is horrible news when someone says you couldn't possibly be included regardless of what you did. Example of this. I've never been athletic. I admire people who are athletic, but I've never been athletic. Sometimes when I was in elementary school and maybe junior high a little bit, the, the kids would choose up teams. The moment of choosing up teams for me was probably one of the worst moments of my life. I hated it. You say, why? Because people acted as if I weren't even there <laughs> when they're choosing up teams. You had two team captains, and they'd pick everybody else. And then I'd be standing there by myself. And that one team captain would say, yeah, and I guess we'll take him. Oh boy, that was enthusiastic, wasn't it? Makes me really want to play for you. Oh, I guess we'll take him. And there I would be, okay? At least I, did. At least I got called in at the last second. It's not good news not to be accepted. It is good news when we say, whosoever will may come. Now, does everyone understand this? This, this, you say, preacher, you get passionate about these things. I do, because wait till you see the Scripture. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Well, let's cover some things that the Bible says. 
Isaiah 53, verse number 6. Prophecy of Christ. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him that is on Christ the iniquity of us all. Put the word all there. All. Christ bore the sins of all. Well, who, by the way, who is the all that has gone astray? Let me ask you a question. Has everybody gone astray? There's not one Calvinist in the world that would deny that the word all in the first part of the verse, the first word of the verse, means everybody. Not one in the world would say that it doesn't, because all have gone astray. They believe that. Okay, that's part, part of their, the, the doctrine of total depravity, which we believe all have gone astray. We do not believe in man's inability. We believe all have gone astray. They would say, oh yes, all have gone astray. But then the word all, the last word all in the verse, can't mean everybody. Pastor, what does it mean? Only the elect. Where does it say that? It doesn't. It doesn't. Do you see, do you see the violence you have to do? Now let me give you a principle. Anytime you need to base a belief system or doctrine of Scripture upon your ability to change the wording of the Bible, you are on thin ice. And, and here's a, you say, well, Pastor, can you, do you understand how sovereignty, and I believe God is sovereign. Please don't misunderstand. Do you, do you understand how sovereignty can, can dovetail together with man's free will? Do you understand all that? Nope. Nope. Ooh. Well, then it must be a contradiction in the Bible. Nope. Nope. The problem's with me. The problem's with me. And it's not a problem with that book. The problem's with me. Well, I can't wait to get to heaven. I've, I've got some questions, folks, about the Bible. Oh, you're the preacher. You're supposed to know it all. <laughs> I have some questions. I'll tell you, I want, I've got a list of questions about the book of Ezekiel that's going to last the first 10,000 years. Okay? What were those wheels that Ezekiel saw? Sure sound like UFOs to me. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I've got questions. But you know, the problem is my understanding. It's not the Bible. Continue on. Point B. John 1 and verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The world. Who is the world there? Sounds like everybody to me. What if you're a Calvinist? You, you substitute the word the elect. The trouble is the word elect doesn't appear there. The word world appears there. John 3, 14 through 18, and I, uh, we've abbreviated this somewhat, but you'll see where we've done that. And verse 36 as well. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth, note the condition, belief, whosoever includes everybody, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him, for God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, put the word world there, the world through Him might be saved. The world through Him has the potential of salvation. It is a real potential. It is a genuine offer. It is not a fake. It is not a sham. It is not a phony. It is not a promise in a used car lot somewhere. It is not an Elmer Gantry. But that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Notice the condition. Belief, belief, belief. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. Very simple words. Folks, I'm glad these are simple words. I'm a simple person. We have children in this church that sit in our Sunday school classes. They need to hear these simple words. Wonderful words of life that salvation is conditional upon whosoever believeth. John 7, verse 37. If any man thirst, put the word any. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. If any man thirst, no one is forbidden. All are welcome to come. It is a matter of their will if they will, if they will come but they are welcome to come. Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. To every one that believeth. It's the power of God. It includes Rick over there. <laughs> he certainly does. Rome, I think. <laughs> Romans 5.16 Romans 5.16 Christ died for the ungodly. Now these are all verses of Scripture. Christ died for the ungodly. Let me ask you a question. According to the Bible, who's the ungodly? Everybody. Are there any godly out there? No, I know you all pretty well. <laughs> no one in this world is godly. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Okay, Christ died for the ungodly. If Christ died for the ungodly, that means He died for all the ungodly. It doesn't say just a couple of the ungodly or a few of the ungodly. He died for the ungodly. Now, folks, just take the Bible for what it says. 
Galatians 3.22. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith might be given to them that believe. Everyone's under sin. A promise is given, and if someone exercises faith, they believe they're saved. But it includes everyone. Why? All are under sin. 1 Timothy 2.4. The Bible speaking of God says, Who will have all men to be saved? God would have them to be saved. That's the will of God. Will all men be saved? No, not all men will be saved. But God would desire that all would be saved. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's God's will. That's God's plan. That is the hope of the heart of God that all will be saved. Now, will they? No. Why won't they be? Well, because they were not predestinated from the foundation. No, wrong, wrong, wrong. Because they refused to receive Christ. Because they ignored the plea of Calvary. That is why men are not saved. They are not not saved because they somehow weren't on the right grocery list in eternity past. Continuing on. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.6 Who gave Himself a ransom for all. Put the word all there. For all. A ransom for all. Folks, who did He die for? He died for all. Okay, Now isn't this unbelievably clear? How much more clear? Well, you say, Pastor, this is so obvious that surely what do they do? They change and rest and wrestle with and add to and delete and reinterpret. And by the way, some of their interpretations are unbelievable. I was reading one uh, commentary on John 3.16 and the author said something about the world there uh, would have only meant within the Jewish context the very confines of the Jewish world, perhaps even excluding Galileans who were looked down upon by Judeans, and then they went into this big cultural thing. Uh-uh. You know why? You know why I know that's not correct? Because it won't fly in Awana. That's why I know it's not correct. It's too complicated for anybody to understand to be saved. And by the way, that's not the obvious thing. Folks, when you read the Bible, the obvious meaning normally just pops right off the page. Okay, a third grader understands John 3.16. Understand where we're going. It's the plain sense of the Bible. It's, just, it's as, clear, as clear can be. Um, 1 Timothy 4.10 We trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. That's a good verse. He's the Savior of all but especially of those that believe. What is the condition for my salvation? It is belief. I am saved. The, the, the atonement of Christ becomes efficacious to me on a personal level when I meet the condition. The condition is belief. I believe the Gospel. I am saved. Now, is Christ presented as a Savior to all men? Absolutely. Can all be saved? Absolutely. Is anyone excluded? No one's excluded. All can be saved. Will everyone be saved? No. Not all will turn to Christ for salvation. Will some be saved? Yes, absolutely. He is the Savior of all, especially of them who believe. Continuing on, verse, uh, point K. Hebrews 2, verse 9 that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Every man. He tasted death for everybody. Not just the elect, folks. It says every. What are you going to do with that? Well, you would have to change it around. And by the way, they do. They do. The more I've delved into the intricacies of this system, the more confused I have become. I've come up with a rule. If so, and I've kind of hinted at it tonight several times. If someone's explanation is too complicated, it's probably not the correct explanation. Because God wants us to understand Himself. The Bible is a revelation of God to man. We wouldn't have to make complicated systems in our mind if we just took the Bible for what it says. Obviously, Calvinism has a convoluted view of God's sovereignty and will even deny the declarations of Scripture to support that position. 2 Peter 3.9 The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All. All should come to repentance. Pastor, will they all? No, they won't all, but God wants them to. Why? Because God so loves the world. He loves everybody. It's God's desire for all men to receive Christ. It will be their choice if they don't. If someone rejects Christ, it's not, uh, it, it's not a rejection of me if I'm the preacher. I don't feel a personal rejection by that. It is not the fact that they couldn't be saved. It is simply the fact that they've made a decision. I remember one time, I was, and this has stuck in my mind for years, 
I was passing out gospel tracts on a street corner one time, and this man asked me, he said, what, what is that? I handed him the pamphlet. And first he received the pamphlet, and, uh, and he looked at it, and he said, what's this about? I said, this talks about the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, it was a religious event that I was at. It, I said, it talks about the blood of Christ and how Jesus Christ, when He died on the cross, He died for your sins. And the man looked at me. Now, he would profess to be a Christian, okay? But he looked at me, and he dropped the pamphlet on the ground, this gospel tract I had. And he became very angry. And he jumped up and down on top of it, just like this. Jumped up and down on top of it, stomping it into the ground. And he said, I just want to hear about my religion. I don't want to hear about the blood of Christ. That was a rejection of the Savior. When that man stands before God Almighty, I believe God will in his mind or in his soul replay that moment of rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it is a man's will. Point, uh, John, 1 John 2, 2, we read it a moment ago. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What are you going to do with that? And then 1 John 4:14, 4, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The word world there. Well, who did Christ die for? He died for the sins of the whole world. Can anybody be saved? Absolutely. What's the condition of salvation? Belief. Who can, be, who can believe? Whosoever will may come. Isn't that simple? To deny it, to change it. How do Calvinists explain these verses? By systematically changing words such as all in world to elect in church. There is no justification for doing such violence to Scripture. None whatsoever. And let me just sum it up with this, folks. And I said it before. The Gospel is good news. I am glad I'm preaching good news. I am glad I'm preaching a Gospel that can see people saved. My dad did not, to my knowledge, have a clear presentation of the Gospel in his adult years. He may have as a, a child attending a Baptist Bible camp that he went to as a boy. To my knowledge, he did not have a, a uh, clear presentation of the Gospel. And he died, as far as we know, lost and without Christ. There have been many opportunities that I've had to visit people in the hospital with cancer. And when I think about that, and several that I've been able to lead even on their deathbed to lead them to the Lord, and I've gone to those visits with urgency in my heart because I think about how I wish that someone would have come to our home with the message of the Gospel. Pastor, could your father have been saved? Absolutely. Because Christ died for him. Now, God knows and eternity is a, is a settled thing with God. Maybe he was as a little boy. We had no evidence or knowledge of that. But let me just say this. When I carry the Gospel, I carry good news. And when I hold the hand of someone, as I did a couple months ago, who had the bad news that they, would, they were facing a terminal illness, and I held this lady's hand, and I looked into her eyes in a lucid moment that she had. She had been in a coma, and she had a lucid moment. The family called me. I looked into her eyes, and I said, Do you understand that Christ died for you? And I went through the Gospel, and she got saved. I said with confidence, Christ died for you. Why? because He died for the sins of the whole world. That little lady's in heaven. A couple, not, not maybe three, four weeks later, I preached her funeral. That little lady is in heaven. I fully expect to see her there because she believed the Gospel that Christ died for her sins. And I could tell her with sweet assurance He died for the sins of the whole world. By the way, she was a sweet lady. I would go to visit her before she passed away several times in the hospital. And she made this comment to someone who told me this later at the funeral. This lady said, you know, she said, Pastor, my mother loved your visits before her death. And I smiled and I thought, well, maybe I had been a blessing to her. And she said, my mother always loved orange popsicles. And she said that whenever you would walk into the room, the whole room would smell like orange popsicles. <laughs> I guess that's a compliment. Folks, we have the Gospel, the saving Gospel of Christ. He died for the sins of the whole world. Let's believe it, and then let's tell some folks about it. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the simplicity of the Bible tonight. Lord, we've covered some serious ground this evening, and Father, we thank You that when we preach of Christ, we preach a Savior who died for all. Lord, there's no one beyond the scope of the message who cannot receive Christ. Father, we love that, and thank You for that. Holy Spirit, I pray 
that You would just help us to have a burden. Help us, Lord, to look upon everyone as a prospect, knowing that their price has already been paid. Bless these thoughts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to take some of...